Great. Good. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Beth Neal. I'm a professor of social work from the University of East Anglia. Um, what we've got lined up this morning is about 20 minutes of me introducing the model, about 20 minutes of Tom and Meg with their experiences of the model, and 20 minutes from Janet, who's also going to um, present another uh, example of a child moving to adoption using this model. So I want to start by introducing um, the team really and thanking my uh, colleagues who've worked on this project with me. So this is a project that I've worked on with Mary Beak and Gillian Schofield at the UEA. Now many of you will be familiar with Mary and Jill's work around a secure base and we've really embedded the secure base model into this project. So I want to really thank um, Mary and Jill and our funders, the Har Hallie Stewart Trust who funded this project. We've also worked with two other colleagues, Janet, who's gonna be speaking later. And Janet was uh, an adoption manager who helped us pilot the model in her local authority. And then over the last couple of years, she's worked with us offering um, training around the model to regional adoption agencies. And Anne Murphy is another colleague who's been also offering training and helping us um, evaluate the model. So that's the kind of whole team. Um, just before I forget, Core and Baff have now published a practice guide around the model. So that's available from the bookshop and Kay will put the link to that in the chat. Okay, so what's this all about? What's the background to this mo uh, model? Well, I suppose the loss of foster families is something that I've been thinking about for kind of over 25 years in my research. And most of you might know that my main research interest is in birth family relationships and contact. And I started a study talking to adoptive parents whose children have recently been placed. I started that in 1996. And obviously I was very interested to talk to people about their children's birth family connections. But actually adoptive parents um, wanted to talk a lot about these foster family connections and the process of their children joining their family. And um, people had such a wide range of experiences, some of them very, that very dramatically illustrated the loss that some children were clearly feeling. You know, adoptive parents um, talked about things like, you know, the child having to be sort of torn away from the foster carer, screaming and kicking, or children that resisted um, that new relationship with their adoptive parents. They pushed their adoptive parents away, but it was the foster carer coming back in and reassuring the child that helped the child to settle. Or children who were just really disorientated after they moved, who couldn't settle, whose routines went to pieces. So I suppose that really first drew my attention to this issue of loss. And we know that when children move to adoption, they have an awful lot to gain. You know, adoption really can offer children that permanent family membership and belonging and a chance to recover from early harm and be part of a family. But, you know, if we think of just the statistics of children coming into care, well, almost half of children who are adopted actually enter care at birth or shortly after birth. So their primary attachment figures are with their foster carers. Um, even if children come into care later on, they've often at the point they're moving to adoption spent more time with their foster family than their birth family. And what we hope for in terms of the quality of foster care is that children have had a chance to build a secure base with their foster carer. So these attachment relationships are really, really important to children um, and for their future. But then they're losing their foster carers, they're losing this relationship at a very vulnerable age. So most children are adopted between the age of one and four, and that's kind of the most difficult age to lose an attachment figure because children are old enough to feel the loss of their carer very keenly, but they're not really old enough to understand abstract concepts like time, 
uh, or adoption even, uh, and, and to hold their foster carer in mind for long periods when they're physically absent. And so our model is really grounded in attachment theory and how can we use attachment theory to help make these moves more easy for children. And the first thing that we've wanted to do is to challenge quite a commonly held, I think, misunderstanding that often people say, well, if children have had this secure relationship with their foster carer, that's really great because they can transfer it to their adoptive parents. And I think that language of the, of the attachment being transferred obscured this loss. The attachment is not transferred. The attachment is the relationship between the child and the foster carer, and it's not transferred. It's lost or it takes a different form. And it's a new relationship that the child has to build with the foster carer, with the adoptive parents. Now, of course, what they can transfer is what they've learned about relationships. So if they've learned from their foster carer that other people can be trusted, that they're lovable, then they can take that internal working model of attachment with them, but they're losing that attachment figure. Um, now, typical practice was variable even before we started our project and lots of agencies were trying to work and improve on this area of practice. But just as a kind of overall picture of what a adoption transitions looked like, I mean, we collected data from a large survey of adoptive parents, and they told us that from the first day they met their child to the day the child moved in full time, the average number of days that adoptive parents reported was 12. And that fits with other research. So it's one or two weeks that these transitions take place over. And they're very stressful for everybody concerned. We know that from a lot of research now that you know, the feelings run really high for foster carers who are anticipating the loss of this loved child. For adoptive parents, they're anticipating the child moving in, which is a massive um, turning point in your life. And for children, they're losing their primary attachment figure and having to get to know people that are on first meeting are strangers to them. And children's feelings, I think, can be overlooked in the process of these moves. And that was really highlighted in the research some of you may be familiar with called The Children Were Fine by um, Boswell and Cudmore. And they also talked about how um, because it's such a difficult emotional period for everybody, there is a temptation sometimes for the moves to be speeded up, that everybody wants to almost get it over with as quickly as possible. And people say, well, the children are fine. But maybe the children are not fine. Maybe the children can't express this loss very openly. Or maybe children have learned because of previous experiences in their life to hide their feelings of loss. Um, now, I suppose when we really started to feel at UEA that we wanted to do something about this area of practice is when, when the, um, the evidence started to emerge from research that this wasn't just a difficult period in the short term for children, but it could pose significant risks for children in terms of their longer term development. So Julie Selwyn highlighted this in her study of adoption disruption, that when adoptions had gone wrong, quite often adoptive parents reflected back to the process of the child moving in. And they talked about how difficult and stressful it was uh, and how things just did not get off to a good start. In the survey that we carried out with over 300 adoptive parents, we did a statistical analysis of factors that affected children's development later down the line. So uh, we had information about children's outcomes and we had information about a whole range of risk factors pre-adoption, during their time in care, etc. And we included as a risk factor in our statistical model whether the adoptive parents um, felt that that transition into the adoptive family was very difficult for the child. So we put that in our, our model and it was one of the most um, significant factors in predicting poor outcomes for the children later on. So I think this really said to us, we 
it, it's such an important area of practice to try and get things right for children. So can we offer some guidance to the field around this? That was our starting point, really. Um, OK, so we got together, we started off with doing a, a, a lot of consultation with other academics, with experts by experience. We talked to adoptive parents, foster carers. We consulted with practitioners who were trying to make changes in this area. And we put together a, a, a model of moving children to adoption, which we then piloted in two local authorities. So we asked those local authorities over the course of a year to apply um, our practice guidance and materials to every child they moved to adoption. And uh, we provided support with the implementation of that model. And at the end of the year, we collected feedback on what do these moves look like under the new model and how are they experienced by foster carers, um, adoptive parents, we also collected information from children's social workers, fostering social workers, adoption social workers, um, so we could get a sense of how it's working out, uh, particularly for the children, but from the perspective of professionals and people with lived experience. Now, the learning from the pilot was very positive. Um, most people felt that this was a really useful model and that it was helping children to settle in well. So we went back to our funders and we said, right, OK, we want to incorporate the learning from the pilot, make some tweaks to the model and develop a range of practice materials that we can make, make more widely available, freely available on the Internet delivered through a website. And so that's what we've been working on over the last two or three years and then doing lots of workshops to disseminate the model. So what we learned when we talked to people about this area of practice is that it was not really going to be possible to develop a, a kind of a standard formula for moving children. You know, do this on day one, do this on day five, by day 10, you should be here because there's too many different variables. I mean, most importantly, there, there is the child. Children are all different. They differ in age. They differ in experience. They differ in their reactions to separation. So um, we went for a model that was more, um, how can we think, how can we make individual decisions by going back to the relevant theory? So our model is underpinned by the secure base model and it works around key principles that should be applied in every case. So here's briefly the secure base model developed by uh, Mary and Jill. It's, you know, it's completely grounded in um, attachment theory, and we can use this to think about how foster carers can provide a secure base for, for a child, how adoptive parents can as well. And crucially, during this transitional period, I suppose what we're aiming for, the idea is that the foster carer has been the secure base for the child. So they are really crucial in helping the child encounter this new relationship, this new set of experiences, and supporting them through and after that process to give them time to start building that secure base with their adoptive parents before the foster carer disappears out of the picture. So there's no point in time where the child is suddenly left without anybody that they really trust. So it's not a prescriptive model. Um, we don't prescribe timescales or particular things to do on different days. It's all about individual planning. And I hope in the two case examples you're going to hear, you can see how these moves could be quite different for different children. But in every case, every child, regardless of the situation, we're asking people to think about and apply six key principles. 
So first of all, think about the relationship between the foster carers and the adoptive parents. That is crucial to getting these, these moves right. So uh, look for opportunities to start building that relationship between foster carers and adoptive parents from as early on as possible in the process. Um, secondly, that it's really important for adoptive parents and children to become familiar with each other before adoptive parents start to take over the care. So you'll see how that works out in the model in a minute. And we talk about the importance of observation and play visits before adoptive parents start doing, you know, nappy changing, feeding, etc. The third principle is about making sure that all the arrangements and timescales focus on the needs of the child and don't get distracted by all the other things that can get in the way. Very much related to that, that throughout this process, it's really important to, for everyone around the child to think about their feelings and hold them in mind and respond to them sensitively. And that really um, means the whole range of children's feelings, because children might feel very um, excited to be moving to adoption. They might have a lot of positive feelings. They might love meeting their adoptive parents and getting to know them. But at the same time, they might also feel quite scared, quite sad, quite upset, quite anxious. So everybody needs to, to be looking out for how the child is feeling and looking below maybe the surface of, of their behavior and then responding sensitively. So that means, you know, if children are finding it difficult and they need more time, you slow it down. If at an early stage they're very anxious about where they're going to be living, you might want to introduce a visit to the adoptive parents' home um, very early on in the process. So it's about thinking about how children are feeling and responding sensitively. Um, the fifth principle is about continuity, continuity of environment, keeping things as much the same as possible for children, but continuity of those foster family relationships. So the foster family do not disappear on moving day. They are there after the child has moved to help uh, manage the loss of the foster family and help the child build trust in the adoptive family. And the sixth principle principle is about that flexibility in planning, particularly um, to be flexible to respond to the child's uh, reactions. So we, we're saying you can think about this process of moving children in three stages that we call getting to know each other, making the move and supporting relationships after the move. So what we found in our pilot is that when people applied our model, it, it um, added more, it added length to the process of children moving, but the additional length was really in stages one. Um, so we counted again the number of days from the adopters first meeting the child, discounting any bump into meetings, to the, the placement day, and that was 21. So compared to our previous research where it was 12, you can see there's a longer lead in to the moves, plus um, there's foster care contact after moving day. In almost all cases, we were able to achieve that foster care is visiting within at least one or two days of the move. So this first stage um, begins after the match with the adopters has been identified and before that more intensive activity of stage two and it involves the first of all the foster carers and the adoptive parents getting to know each other and then adoptive parents and children getting to know each other but in a playful way so it's things like um you know doctors visiting and just talking to the child playing with the child um hanging around and observing not going straight in and trying to look after them 
Now, we know that uh, practice around the country is quite varied in terms of whether adoptive parents might have met children before the match is agreed. We, but what we're saying is, even if adoptive parents have met children before, it's a different process when you're building up this relationship in terms of the move happening. So, um, you know, do start again, even though there might have, you know, there might have been some meetings before these moves, these meetings now have a different purpose. Now the match is agreed. So look for opportunities for foster carers and adoptive parents to meet without the child, not in a formal meeting. So they can just chat, start exchanging information. You know, one thing we suggest could be helpful is for foster carers to fill in the secure based checklist, which has a lot of detail about the child and their behavior and to talk that through with adoptive parents. Now, these adult relationships can be supported um, quite easily also by phone conversations, emails, WhatsApp, photographs, messages, videos. And we saw during the pandemic that to some extent, um, these virtual methods can be used to build the connection between adoptive parents and children as well. But really, you do need those face-to-face -face visits for the child and adoptive parents to, to build those in as much as you possibly can. So initially, when adoptive parents are visiting, it's really important that the foster carer is physically present um, so that the child has that secure base. Now, when you get to the point that you see you've got this trust and rapport between the adults and the child is now showing signs that they're very comfortable with the adoptive parents they're enjoying being with them they're maybe approaching them they might even be asking for them to you know can can um, the adoptive mum give me my dinner or do my bath when you see the child's ready and have got that beginning level of trust then you start building up adoptive parents visiting much more regularly and intensively and taking over the caregiving um, now typically this lasts that kind of nine to 14 days and the foster carer is initially physically present and then gradually stepping backwards so that's why this relationship between the adults is so important because there's lots of fine judgments to make on a daily basis about when the foster carer needs to step back when he or she needs to step back in you know if children are upset they might need to step back in or there might be a time where they just hold back and let the adoptive parents deal with it so the better you've got that trust and rapport and communication between the adults the more people can make the right decision for the child it is a period of time where particularly we need to monitor children's feelings and help them name those feelings and support them with their feelings. Because it might be not until this more intensive activity happens that children really realise, yes, they're moving, they're leaving their foster carer. So strong feelings can come up at this stage. Now, the children also need to start becoming familiar with the adoptive parents' home at this stage, although for some children, you could introduce a visit in stage one to the adoptive parents' home. Foster carers need to be physically with the children initially, we recommend, but uh, then gradually moving out and remaining psychologically present. So they might be you know, they might leave the child for a few hours at the adoptive parents home, but they're nearby, they're on the phone, they can come back quickly if needed. And the adoptive parents are, are you know, talking about the foster carer when they're not physically there. So then we get to placement day and the child moves and uh, what happens after that. So we talk about our third stage going up to the first review, although we acknowledge that in a lot of cases it's beneficial for some foster carer contact to continue after that point because the foster carer, you know, has been an important part of the child's life story. They have lots of memories of the child at a young age and children can often value that ongoing connection. So um, we 
ask that the moving plan, you know, has a clear plan for foster carer visits after placement day. And we don't recommend that those visits should be delayed as often, I think, has been typical practice in the past that, um, you know, there's an idea that uh, for, you know, a week, a fortnight, a month, even six months, foster carers should not visit so children can settle. What we argue is foster carers should visit so children can settle. So the role of the foster carer when they're visiting is to help the child to settle. So, to the, you know, the foster carer visiting reassures the child that they haven't been forgotten. It helps them maybe express their loss. It helps adoptive parents then to offer comfort for that loss. Um, and it gives a chance for the foster carers to be reassuring and, and you know, say, um, encourage the child to look to their adoptive parents and to trust them. So um, this often includes in our model, the foster carer staying nearby. So if there's long distances involved, foster carers might, you know, be have some accommodation nearby. So they're on hand to give the child a lot of support in the early days of the move. So, you know, what we're hoping is happening here is the child is having that support to build the trust in the adoptive parents and manage the loss at the same time and we have to think quite widely because they lose not just this relationship with their primary attachment figure but the other children in the foster home the pets the play group they want to they went to so we have to think about loss in this wider um, sense and maybe you know later on uh, when the child is a little bit more settled, maybe the pet does want to come and visit or the other children want to come and visit. So we want to fade the foster family down, gradually reducing the physical and psychological presence. And that softens the impact of the move for the child. It's also, we hope, theoretically reassuring for adoptive parents to have that backup from the foster carers. Um, so that's our stage three. So this is the kind of theory, but uh, let's hear about how it works out in practice. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hand you over to Tom and Meg to talk about their situation. And then we'll hear more from Janet. OK, so. Right, over to you, Tom and Meg. Thank you. Hello. Can everyone hear us OK? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. um, so we've adopted um, two twin girls with their 19 months old now, and we've had them for three months. And we, so it was back in September, October time that we were doing the moving to adoption, the transition with our girls. Um, and yeah, it reflects everything that Beth has just said, really, what, what happened. It started off um getting to know Trudy the foster carer it was mostly done through sort of video calls we had like a planning meeting with our social worker Emma and Trudy and our um and we were like whatsapping and talking about practical things about the girls and getting to know so just yeah chatting really yeah so um we were pleased that um so after after our match after the adoption panel, um, we we had the plan in place to begin transitions. We got a decision back slightly sooner, so that gave us a bit of extra time at the top of the, um, the, the first stage, stage um, where we could do some additional video calls um, and our coffee meetups. Yeah, we planned um, transition objects. Uh, so we had some teddies, we had photo books full of our faces, we had. Um, bigger photos of our laminated Very photos nice. so they could play with them um, uh, but it just meant that as well as having those transition objects we were also able to yeah start being in the background so like in the video calls they could hear our voices we sent um, recording story recordings of um, we recorded stories um, which then the foster carer like played to the girls so they could get used to our voices mm -hmm. um, so it was, yeah, it was done sort of like get, getting to know. And then in some of those coffee drop-ins, the girls were 
were present, but we were going there to see Trudy and we were very conscious to have that very hands off, just getting to know us to show them that our bond and relationship with Trudy, we had, we trusted each other and um, we had a really good relationship with our foster carer. She made us feel incredibly welcome yeah. and really at ease. It felt like we were going like around to an auntie's house. And I really think that was key in to, to making transitions feel comfortable for everyone involved. Otherwise, I just, yeah, it just allowed us to be us and feel relaxed. And yeah, so the first few times um, we would go, uh, we just went for an hour, two hours. Um, we were just playing with the girls, but not in a not in an intense, mm -hmm. you know, we weren't there to see them. We were there to, we sort of, the way that we contextualised it was that we were there to see Trudy and then just as if you were going out to see a friend you would you would say hi to their kids you would you would play with them a little bit but we weren't mm. imposing ourselves it was very much about mm. just that familiarity and then as time went on um, I think we had two or three of those one or two hour mm. um, uh, coffee mornings and then the next week we started slightly Trudy started showing us the care and yeah. how the care was given and so we started to learn and um but only through watching we weren't we yeah weren't doing any of it, no no we weren't doing any of it and just through observations and the girls took to us really well so they're, they're 16 months so they don't and and how they are they don't have they didn't yeah they, they're development's a little bit delayed so they don't they don't have the cognitive ability like understanding they're not communicating verbally they're not um, no so uh, there's no sort of like single words or no. um anything like that that's happening so um we were having to read through body language instead and, yeah and their behaviors and stuff yeah the girls um one um of our girls at that point was presenting as very um inward very insular um didn't clearly didn't feel um safe straight away with with new people so we we were taking it very slow with her our other girl um was uh the complete the, the polar opposite you know straight up to you um yeah. wanting to be a chalk and cheese as twins yeah <laughs> um so it was uh finding sort of the right approach for both of them wasn't it and and it it was helpful that we could sort of we knew that if if one of them was showing a certain thing then the other one would probably be feeling a similar way mm, yeah I think so um B who is the one who was more insular more nervous more um is quite scared of new people we um were a bit more I think we were kind of led by her because we knew H would, you know, was always going to be more further forward. But um, so with the, so we got to know the foster carer, the, our foster carer as well, I think what was really important was really gentle with us. She didn't overwhelm us with loads of information straight away. She gradually took different pieces of the, like their care. She introduced it at different, she, so like meal times, and then we'd develop. Uh, I can't get my words out. <laughs> uh, nappies. Yeah, nappies, and then we'd do bit bits Changing at a time. Clothes. It's also because I can hear the girls in the background <laughs> <laughs> just being put down <laughs> with their nanny. Um, so, um, so they yeah. So she was really gentle with us and um, helped like take us through that before we started being caregivers to the girls and. We did. We were led by the girls when it was time that we felt okay. It feels ready now for the for changing their nappies and and. and so the first time I changed a nappy, um, our foster care is very close by, standing with me. Um, we were kind of almost doing it together. She was passing me wipes, um, and then as time went on, she would just slowly fade into the background a little bit. Obviously, we we didn't want the girls to ever become distressed we didn't want any sort of negative experiences in those early days so if they were crying you know that level of care we just went straight back to the foster care and didn't attempt to um you know move Comfort too fast yeah. um, with that with that caregiving so she was mm. 
it was very gentle and if if there was a wobble then she'd come straight back in and make sure mm. that um, they always felt as safe as possible and we were really determined to not try and create those negative experience like holding on and trying to comfort and it's mm. like we're not the one that they want they want Trudy yeah. so we were really um we didn't try and force that um and it was really wonderful as time went on when they were then coming to us for care comfort and asking for us later down the line which yeah. um it it yeah just constantly being led by them really um and I think also to say we were really prepared for how this transition would look like and this um model we were because our the training that we had um through being prepared as adopters it was the secure base model and attachment theory and all these layers of what makes um that like Beth has spoken about we were we were taught um and we touched on all these different areas so it all made sense it all kind of we knew why it was so important and so we had a lot of respect for why we were being so, like why it was so important for us to take things slowly and then um we'd in the planning of transitions um with our foster carer and our social worker we'd we'd got a kind of step-by-step -step plan which was very much based on this mm -hmm. um we'd all talked about where the op opportunities were to kind of flex forward and flex backward depending on how the girls reacted we had some kind of spare days in the plan if you know mm -hmm. um you know if they're doing really well we'll bring that forward we'll spend some more time at the next stage instead if they're not doing so well then we'll take a little bit longer and um mm. uh, we also had the mid stay uh, the mid transition review didn't we where yeah we, we all we got together with our social worker the girl's social worker trudy's social worker trudy's social worker and, and, and all made sure that everything was progressing well which yeah. which, which for us it really was and it the girls was, reacted yeah. really really well um and 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 day by day and week by week you we just saw their attachment with us slowly starting to build um and as trudy started to just sort of step back from that day-to-day -day care that became less and less worrying to them they weren't um you know in 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 the first few days they were um looking for her when she went out of the room and then as time went by they were looking for her less and less and mm. um and, and we were able to comfort them mm. more yeah they came they, they would come to us and safe like B fell asleep on us when she was her nap time and like she'd never fell asleep on anyone before um and things like that there was real clear signs that they were they were trusting us mm. um and then and also with that that mid review that we had with the social workers it was um in that that it was quite clear that the girls were doing really well they were responding really well to us and so we um decided that was when we were flexible and we decided with the consent of the social workers to bring a day forward that the girls would come and visit our home so um they came we, we saw that the the trust with us was good um their level of um worry with trudy was not excessive so we felt that actually the the bigger thing was going to be how they dealt with the new environment of our home yeah and they um and what we'd been doing in um, the lead up to that we'd taken them out for walks and then um and it was just like really short little walks in their buggy and then we'd um and then it became a bit longer and then we took them out in the car to get them used to the car and the car seats and they'd responded so well to that it just seemed like what Trudy herself said like I'm not doing anything anymore and it was just so clear that they were ready to come mm. and see the new home and at home we um we bought the same high chairs they, they had quite a few issues around feeding we struggled with weaning and so feeding they're a bit de like and also their gross area. motor skills in terms of sitting up um, they needed a bit of extra support so yeah. they needed a more supportive high chair so we got them the same high chairs that the foster carer had we um got um toys from the foster carers and um put them in the space so they had like some toys that they were familiar with um and then and we tried to make sure that we had the same um spaces available so for example the foster carer had a, a playpen um so we made sure that we had a playpen 
mm. um, so that we could mm. sort of mirror the same routines and yeah and they struggled with that to begin with yeah like and with twins it was like really important that we could have them in that space, <laughs> safe space to go to the loo and such so but they really did struggle with it to begin with so what Trudy did was um she gave us at the bottom of her playpen she had like a blanket and it was pretty grimy in that and we kept it grimy and we put that in the bottom and that really did it it worked wonders and we changed the position so the girls could see us more and it kind of represented the position of that it was the same in her living room that, and that, it did really it worked well yeah that that's probably something that we did in the um in the third post placement stage isn't it we, mm, yeah. we we'd had them for a little while at that stage and seeing Trudy and continuing to see Trudy um was great for the girls in terms of that emotional support but also it just from a very practical point of view being able to talk to the person who knew the girls best um and had been caring for them um so Trudy was their foster care for just under a year um meant that we kind of had access to this great resource of information and solutions to problems mm. um, and we could kind of have really open conversations with her about you know mm. so so for example um, they're, they're struggling with a playpen what do you think we should do yeah how, how can we make them feel more safe and comfortable she always had advice didn't she and yeah. we done things like we had um before so before transitions we started washing our clothes and our and our linen and stuff in the same washing powder that um, Trudy uses. We slept with the blankets that we gave them, so they smelled of us before we when we before we gave them to them. And then um, before we were about to go, for when just before placement uh, day, when they moved in, we they were sleeping with the sheets that they were going to have from ours, so they smelled of Trudy's home. And then we brought them and we put them back in the. Um, and the dirty pajamas that they'd had from the night before so that like all this the same smells happen so we tried to really think about and sort of like our age appropriate as well because obviously like you know we couldn't make a book with a story about who we mm. are and where they're going so it was just a simple photo book we, we tried to do things age appropriately and that was with all the support of our social worker so what's really key in this is even though so our social worker Emma Mackworth was how, you know she was on the peripheries but she was so fundamental to making it work and making it feel okay because she definitely mentally and emotionally supported us through the transitions as well as Trudy and I think without having our social worker to like lean back on and speak to and go to with any concerns especially because it's such a sensitive time you don't want to offend your foster carer so it was so important to be able to have your social worker to go back to and like if there was any worries or the things that were stressing you out like she was just there so even though she wasn't physically present I spoke to her quite often on the phone and she was always available for mm. for us um so in terms of what that <clears throat> post placement um contact looked like um we had a visit from the foster carer in the week um, mm. of or well, the day after placement the day, day after placement she came day. in the morning and to see them mm. well the morning of placement day sorry isn't it they yeah so the morning of placement day she came to see them and then um and that went well that seemed really like quite relaxed and it was fine wasn't it it was quite yeah. normal we, you know we had like we were seeing Trudy lots at the time and then Trudy came back again a few days later a few days later and then I think it was a week later and we kind of those were coffee mornings weren't they yeah so she would come for a couple of hours um she, I think she came during um breakfast or lunch on one of a meal time um and uh it just sat with us kind of didn't take on any caregiving obviously but mm. Um, we had warm conversations, we talked about how they developed, we just, so it kept that kind of, that warm social um, uh, feeling going on. Yeah, yeah. and so B, B, who's the more introverted one, was 
was definitely starting to show like secure attachment with us when if a, a different social workers come in she would look at us to check if it was safe yeah ha, um h she was a bit more um and our social worker picked up on this she was sort of like there was like a sense of um her sometimes looking for someone else like she seemed a little bit more um she didn't have those clear cues that they yeah, had she was yeah. she was um it's a little bit more kind of maybe confused but she h is a lot more was in particularly a lot more kind of aware b is caught up a lot but um i so we but Tr uh, trudy the foster carer came back um, about three times and we're still in contact with her so from the beginning so the first video call and starting to chat to get to know Trudy was the 28th of September placement day was the 20th of October and then visit, Trudy's last goodbye visit was the 10th of November so that's kind of the time scale but so roughly it's about six weeks that the whole process went across um, and, and that felt days. appropriate up to placement day yeah 22 days from first contact through to placement day and then um that felt about right there was um i think i, I and we're still in touch with trudy throughout this we've been um in touch through whatsapp the girls haven't seen her or had any video calls or anything from her since um november we we were going to see her in december but that didn't work out um, we're, I'm in contact with her now thinking about meeting up, but I'm actually going to be seeking some advice from our social worker because H is going through a bit of a funny, another funny attachment. It's like something's going on there and don't know quite what that is. So, um, clearly it's quite a critical stage with yeah, attachment, isn't it? Yeah. And just trying to unpick that and understand what's going on to, to kind of see if, how best to do to see Trudy would be so um it would be um yeah and that would be with seeing Trudy's children as well so the loss for the girls was definitely through um their foster carer but also the siblings that were in the house there was a 13 year old girl and an eight a 10 year old boy yeah and he and they had especially the girl had a really strong relationship with H and so um um yeah so they, they and they've had lots of children around them since but we are aware of that loss and also the dogs mentioning the pets um they definitely um but they've got yeah they, and they love my mum's dog and I think you can tell like they're so used to dogs um but she was like looking for the dog underneath her high chair who she would normally feed and he wasn't there anymore so um yeah sort of like just it, the loss is definitely there even mm -hmm. though they're pre-verbal um, obviously, as, as we know, um, and I would just say is that I think how I really do believe that without this um, um, really sort of like intense kind of prolonged transition period, I do not believe the girls would have progressed as much as they have. So B um, wasn't able to crawl. She wasn't able to sit up unaided. She was rolling like a sausage and star moving around like a star to move around and now she can sit up unaided she can, can get herself sit, sat up she can she can crawl she's now cruising and the physio's just and she can stand aided she can stand aided she's just and the physio's just astounded with her progress and has no worries anymore and we think what that trying to understand what that is i really think like you know we wouldn't have been able to achieve that with her as her new parents if she didn't trust us if she mm. didn't have that security and trust in us to be able to help her progress because she's such you know she's she's really you know she has been impacted by trauma I have no doubt about that they were both severely prem so it's you know I think it's just yeah I just don't believe that we would have been able to achieve what we've been able to and they wouldn't be as balanced and as settled as they are they haven't regressed they haven't like it just, yeah they just flourished haven't they they've done so well and I think you know they've come from a foster carer who you know was really amazing it was a very busy household though whereas like you know and with us we've been able to focus in on them and really like push things forward 
but yeah just like I say I don't think we would have been able to if the girls didn't truly trust us and have mm. that time to learn to trust us and get to know us Thank you so much, Tom and Meg. That's really, really valuable just to hear all the detail and to, you know, hear uh, about your girls and their reactions is so important. So thank you so much for sharing your experiences and uh, hopefully you can stay for the questions. Yeah. And I'll, yes. I'll hand over to, before we take questions, I'll hand over ja to Janet just to finish off. So I'm going to share my um screen again uh, shall I, i'll introduce myself while that's coming up yeah. um so yeah my name's janet barker so i'm i'm actually manager um part-time manager of the team that um tom and meg social worker is in so I've heard all these stories about how wonderful the girls are doing um, from their social worker and it, it's it's really 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 good to hear so that was that was great thank you um, Tom and Meg um, so the case example I'm going to use is a slightly different um, scenario it was one of the cases as Beth mentioned earlier Norfolk um, was one of the pilot areas and I'm a team manager within Norfolk um, and a lot of the matches that were followed during the practice project were actually managed um, within our service and within my team. Um, so I was really, really heavily involved. And this little boy that I'm going to talk to you about, um, this was one of the children that actually moved during the practice project. So his transitions were followed as part of that. Um, obviously it's all been anonymized, um, uh, but it, it is based um, on a, on a real case. Um, so it's a very different um, scenario to, to Tom and Meg's um, in that it was one child um, who I've called Freddie. Um, he was obviously much older than um, their two little girls were um, when they moved. He was actually three and a half at the time when the transitions began which is obviously at the higher end of, of um, most of the children that we place for adoption. Um, he'd been with his foster carer for a long time, so nearly two years. So, um, yeah, twice as long as, as, as those girls that, that Tom and Meg were talking about. Um, and before he was in foster care, he'd actually spent quite a lot of time at home. So he'd been at home for about 18 months. And whilst he was at home, um, he was exposed to domestic violence and parental drug use. Um, there was physical abuse um, within the household and neglect. So he'd had a pretty rough start um, to life. Um, he'd then come in into care when, um, when he was about 18 months old. And initially he'd been placed with his two older siblings, um, but they had, didn't have a plan for adoption, so they moved to long-term foster care about six months before Freddie moved. He was very aware of that. He was a very, um, yeah, he was very clued into what was going on around him, and he'd gone with his foster carers to take his brothers to their new placement. So he'd already had this this huge loss, um, and as Tom and Meg were saying, you know, it, there's an accumulation of, of, of losses that, that impacts children, and that was the case for him as well. There was a feeling um, that because the foster carer had looked after Freddie for so long that she was really going to struggle um, to let him let him go after such a long time. That's a phrase that you do hear um, said. So that was also in people's minds. Um, and also this was a match within Norfolk. Um, but Norfolk, um, as most people will know, is a, is a very large county and um, Freddie was at one end of it and the, the adopters were at the other end. So although it was a match within Norfolk, in some ways it, it felt more like a match, uh, an out of county match because the travelling times were long, much longer, I think, than in um, the case with the twins. And so I think you'll see when I take you through the stages that that does impact on the way that things were um, organised. So in this case, the adopters had um, met 
well, he, they'd observed Freddie once before in a park in a sort of arranged meeting, what some people might refer to as a blind viewing. Um, and they had met the foster carers twice. Once would have been an initial meeting with the social worker to hear more about Freddie, and once would have been a more formal placement meeting. So there was some relationship there already, but as Beth said earlier, that, that, was, that was for a different purpose. Those meetings were about deciding, is this the right match, rather than actually preparing for transitions. So that was the, that was was those were the things that were taken into account when we planned um, this um, transition plan. So if we go next one. So this is um, stage one. Um, and I think this was this was early on for us. We we obviously we've got this um, it's much more embedded into our practice this model now. And I think one of the things we learned in the early days that I don't think we put enough emphasis on the adult to adult relationship. Um, it, that really really is very important. That in stage one um, there are opportunities face to face if possible, but sometimes that's not possible. And we've learned from COVID that video calls and telephone and email can also be very effective. So I don't think that these adopters and foster carers had physically met each other um, early on, um, other than the formal um, meetings that I've already spoke about, but there was email and telephone contact between panel um, and before the intensive um, introductions. During stage one, there were three relatively short, um, I think, as Tom said, those visits for them were about a couple of hours in those early stages. And that was that was fairly typical, I think. And it was the same in this case. So they were relatively short, but getting a bit longer. There were three visits to the adopter's home and a day in between each visit. So essentially over about a week, um, we had these um, three visits in stage one. Um, they were very much observation visits. There was some play um, led by Freddie. Um, it was very, very positive right from the beginning. Um, and everybody was really happy how it was going. And I think there was a sense, and I think this is not unusual, that, um, that the adopters and foster carers were really pleased with how it was going and kind of their instinct was to move it on a bit quicker and for the adopters to take on their care tasks perhaps a bit more quickly. But the, 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 the social workers that were part of that team around the child were kind of saying, no, let, let's not rush this. He really needs to trust you before you start to do um, more intimate care tasks. And everybody was, was, was fine with that. It, it's just, I think, part of the process to keep reminding each other of what the principles are and why it's important for that trust to be there but I think you know that's been made really really highlighted by what Tom and Meg have said. The only worry that really came up in stage one and it wasn't a big worry was that there was really a lot going on for Freddie um, so on the days between the stage one visits the foster carer had for the best possible um, reasons arranged trips out and family gatherings and things like this which really would have been much better arranged before stage one started because those in between days in, in stage one, the intention of those was much more to give everybody a bit of time and space for reflection and that was getting lost a bit. So that was addressed. Um, I mean, one, of the, one of the things about this being part of the practice project was that what was really good about the project was that everybody was involved. So the foster care and social worker was very involved as well as a child social worker and it gave it a really really strong kind of team feel and the foster carer social worker addressed that and, and it was fine it settled and it wasn't a big concern so that all went very well so we move on to stage two um so i think one of the things with this model that, that beth has already said and that it, it, it's not prescriptive it is going to vary according to um the child's needs and the circumstances and I think stage two in this particular case was relatively short, I think, and intense. And, and that was driven partly by the geography, because not only were they a very long way apart, but Freddie really was not good in the car. So him traveling long distances really didn't work well. So I think stage two does feel quite intense, um, but there are reasons for that. And I think it's, it is about individual circumstances. 
So there were six visits over seven days with one rest day. So stage two was was relatively short at just a week, really. Um, as um, would be very typical, that was first of all visits adopters to foster home and then moving to the adopters home. And that shift happened on about day 10. Um, as, as Meg and Tom described, there would have been um, a review meeting around that time for everybody to feel that was the right thing for it to shift and that, that, that it didn't need a bit longer. Sometimes it does. On day 12, Freddie had his first overnight stay um, with the with the um, adopters, but the foster carer was still close by. Um, then she would have stayed in the local area for a few days around the end of stage two and the beginning of stage three. Um, so although he was technically still in her care on that day, he actually spent a day of uh, having an overnight stay with his adopters. Um, and though these visits obviously um, were, were longer than those in stage one, um, up to about six hours, um, and the official placement day was on day 13. Um, again, all went very well during stage two. By the time it got to the end of stage two, the adopters had taken over all the care tasks with the support of the foster carers. Um, Freddie was very accepting of them taking over care, which obviously suggested that, that he, he had built that trust with them and everybody was, was really pleased with with how things have gone um, before the move. Stage three, um, and as Beth said earlier, I think most it, it's true to say that most of the extra length in um, transitions using this model comes in either stage one or stage three. And I think this, this case illustrates that really well because um, you can see straight away that stage three was actually um, very lengthy with a, with a lot of visits. So that's where I say stage two was intense and short, but that was kind of compensated for by stage three being long. And there were actually nine visits by the foster carer in stage three, the first five of which were on consecutive days. So it is a bit arbitrary. You could argue that maybe some of those visits you could see as being in stage two. Um, after that, there were lengthening gaps between the visits. So the whole transition actually went on for 34 days, um, but with most of that additional length in stage three. In stage three, there was a very definite um, change. Um, just two days after placement day, Freddie's behavior became very challenging. Um, he appeared to be very rejecting of adoptive mum, um, and that included, included lashing out physically, um, you know, kicking and, and hitting. Um, that's obviously always very, very difficult for any adoptive parents, um, particularly when it's so early on in placement and their confidence as that child's parent is, is only really um, beginning to build. Um, and there was, there was the, it is the case in, in this particular case that, that the visits by the foster carer did seem to trigger off some of this behaviour, presumably because it was actually related to the loss of the foster carer and the emotions that went around that. Um, and it would have been, it would have been easy for the adoptive parents to say, oh no, this triggers off this difficult behaviour. It isn't a good idea. We shouldn't be doing it. But they really didn't react to it like that because they had this really strong relationship with the foster carer already. The foster carer was actually able to support them. She was able to empathize because actually it was very similar to her own experience when Freddie was first placed with her, that his, he appeared to reject her, not her husband, but very specifically her. Um, and, you know, they were able to talk about it as a way that for Freddie, his, his um, loss and the impact of the loss on him um, comes out the way it's acted out and that that's, that's a very normal part of loss and grief and bereavement um, and to depersonalize that and work through it. So in the, that, that first couple of weeks we were actually worried that this placement might disrupt. We had commissioned extra therapy to begin as soon as possible to try and shore up the placement but actually after about two weeks it just all 
dissipated they all worked through it together the the additional therapy never actually had to happen um and it was and the, the relationship that the foster carer and the adopter had um definitely made a difference i have absolutely no doubt about that um and was crucial to the placement surviving those early difficulties um it did continue i've lost a bit at the bottom but what it said was that the, the placement continued they adopted legally adopted freddie um within a few months as you would kind of expect um and there is a continuing relationship between the foster carers and the adopters and also a continuing relationship between freddie and his brothers who are or who are placed in foster care so the adopters are very open to that continuity from um, the time before Freddie came to live with with them. So that's that's another example of a very kind of different, um, I think, transition. But but nevertheless, although it's very different in many ways, you can see how the same principles have been applied and and how it it has been very beneficial to um, outcome in that scenario as well. Um, Okay, I think that's up for questions. Beth, you're you're muted. I think you're talking, but you're muted, so <laughs> still can't hear you. There we are. How yeah, about that's that? It. Yeah, good. Perfect. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, just before we go to questions, I want to move my slide on one more, but there we are, just to uh, talk through some points about implementation. Uh, this relates to certainly at least one comment I've seen in the chat about uh, the need for everybody to be on board with this way of doing things. So um, some of the tips we've covered in our um, practice guide advert again and on our website we've got an implementation guide for managers is you know we think at an agency level if you want to adopt the model you know first of all the adoption team need to familiarize themselves with the model it's important for that panel members know what you're doing as well and then Obviously, most agencies now are regional, so regional adoption agencies need to start talking to their local authorities who feed into them, their local VAAs. And it's probably quite helpful to have a working group to set up to take it forward. Um, all the professionals around the child do need to know kind of what the plan is and be involved and understand the model so that's children social workers and managers fostering social workers we've heard about that in these two case studies how important it is that everybody knows what the principles are I think foster carers and adoptive parents do need to be prepared and Tom and Meg talked about how they'd had some of that built into their initial training a lot of agencies we know do use the secure base model so that's an easy um, to add this bit on we've developed information you know specifically for foster carers and adopters a leaflet about the six principles and how they can apply them when helping children to move so think about whether you build that into initial training or ongoing training or are you going to address it at an individual level, talking through the model with foster carers and adoptive parents? But it's absolutely important that people know what you're doing and why. Um, it might be important to look at your agency documentation and language and think about policies and procedures. So some things people have told us they've addressed at an agency level are you know, getting buy-in from the senior managers in the agency who hold the purse strings to pay foster carers after placement day so that um, they can put all that time into helping children settle and not, you know, feel that they have to have another child in there straight away. So, you know, you, everybody in the agency from the kind of bottom to the top really needs to be on board with it all. And uh, we also talk in the book about how you can use the secure base model to think about support for the social workers during this area of practice. So um, 
on the website, you'll find our practice guidance, the leaflet for foster carers and adopters, training sessions that you can use with trainers notes, uh, a video of me talking about the research that you can use in training sessions, the secure based checklists that I mentioned, which are about helping foster carers to talk about the detail of children's behaviours, the implementation guidance and useful links and resources. And all that, if you want it just in one place in your hot hand, is all in the, the Coram Bath guide. So thank you very much for listening.